that was very, very uh, revealing. Uh, I, I know it is uh, uh, almost you are here one hour. I'm not going to uh, share or to have my own views about Asia Minor, but I will ask uh, 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 Terry Stavridis, our uh, good historian here, uh, only for 15 minutes, okay? No more uh, to conclude this uh, uh, seminar. Please, Terry. Thank you. Let us. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Khadji Dimitri, a very informative uh, lecture. Now, with this great man, Eleftherios of Venizelos, where do you start? Well, I'm going to confine myself to three episodes of his life, and I shall be brief. I will start with the year 1915, early 1915. In, in January, Eleftherios Venizelos got approached by Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Secretary of State, to, for Greece to come on side. We were the Entente. And Venizelos said, yippee, that's a great opportunity. So, so he writes these uh, memoranda, it goes to King Constantine. Constantine said, oh, that sounds okay. So he went, he says, I'll think about it. In the meantime, Constantine consults the general staff and Metaxas. And, and as uh, Professor Dimitriou, Haji Dimitriou said, you had these dynastic links, the Queen Sophia being the sister of the Kaiser. So, so Venizelos goes back to, to the king with, with another memoranda, and then finally the king says, nope, I don't accept your thing. I want our country to be neutral. Around this time... In February, March 1915, the Anglo-French Navy was trying to prick the, the, the Turkish defences at the Dardanelles. But Venizelos also had in the, in the back of his mind that if Greece could come on board with the Entente, Greece could, could have contributed naval assistance to, to the British Royal Navy and also... Marines as well. And if that would have happened, we may not have had the Gallipoli campaign. And of course, uh, in March uh, 1915, Venizelos was dismissed by, by, by the king. He sought his resignation, so, so he left. There were elections held in 1915 that Venizelos won in a landslide. And then, of course, and then later, in October 1915, the Anglo-French Marines land in, in Salonika. But Venizelos invited them, that the king didn't like this, so he dismissed him again. And then we have a series of, of royalist uh, governments. In 1916, in June of 1916, the, the king committed an act of treachery, treason as far as I'm concerned. He allowed a combined... Bulgarian German force to occupy Fort Rupel in eastern Macedonia. And this, and Greece was supposed to be neutral. And this was the trigger that Venizelos used to create his provisional government in, Thessalo, in Thessaloniki. In the interim period, until December 1916, the Allies were trying to get Constantine to see if he could come on side with, with the Entente. But Constantine kept, kept uh, putting him off. In the end, the Allies said, we want you to hand over certain mountain guns which could be used against us on the Salonika front. The king said, oh, yes, I'll do this and all that. Uh, so he kept dithering on that. In the end, to, to force the issue, they landed... Anglo-French Marines in, in Athens on December 1 and 2, 1916. French troops were, were wounded and killed, but the French elephant never forgot that. Never forgot that. And then in J June 1917, the, the French uh, send uh, Jonard, tells the king, if you don't resign, we'll blow you out. 
And so the king resigns. Then Venizelos reunites Greece with King Alexander. <coughs> Fast forward to the Paris Peace Conference. In, in December 1918, Venizelos had, had drafted this, this uh, memoranda, which can be v found on the internet, of the Greek territorial claims. He wrote it almost by, by, by memory. So uh, on, the third, uh, on the 3rd and 4th of February 1919, he, he delivers the, the Greek territorial case. Now, I, I won't go through every territorial case that he, that he offered, I'll just, I'll just pick three items. For a start, he would have loved to have had Constantinople, but Constantinople was viewed as a city of great importance. So they talked about Constantinople becoming an international state, an international city. They even talked about being the seat of the new League of Nations, but that never materialised. And in fact, I've written seven articles for the National Herald just on that very issue, based on official British uh, documents. About Pontos, there were Pontian delegation that, that went to Paris and, and told the Venizelos, help us to, to be part of your grand scheme. But Venizelos basically told them, look, I know your problem like that, but we don't have the resources to help you. What we suggest that you do is form, become part of the future Armenian state. And of course, the short-lived Armenian state was came into existence in May 1918. By the end of 1920, it was snuffed out by a combined Kamalist attack from the south, uh, sorry, and, and the Bolsheviks from, from the north. And and of course, the, the big prize that he wanted well, was Smyrna. Now, once he had delivered his case, what what he's the the Allies then decided to form a territorial, a Greek territorial commission. And, and the minutes of those are available in, in the British archives. And the, the French and the British said, Greece must have Smyrna. The attack, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the French and the British said, Greece should have Smyrna. But, but the French and the Italians said, no. And the Americans uh, agreed with that as well. With the with the with with the French Italians. After this, we'll 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 fast forward to uh, to the landing in Smyrna in 1919. Venizelos did not go to Smyrna under his own steam. He got the permission of the Big Three: Woodrow Wilson, Georges Clemenceau, and Lloyd George. Venizelos and Lloyd George were very close friends. Buddies, in fact. In February, March to April, we have a series of conferences that finally sorted out what became the Treaty of Severus, which was never ratified. The, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, did not like that uh, treaty. And in the middle of 1920, that the Kamalists were actually threatening British positions or allied positions along on the opposite side of the uh, of the Sea of Marmara, and so uh, so, so in so, so what happened was that Venizelos received a, a telegram from from Paraskevopoulos, that the Greek the commander in chief of the army of Asia Minor, he said, "We have an opportunity now to dismiss." to uh, push the Turks in, inland and defeat them and, and crush them once and for all. And in the meantime, the British Navy did shell some of the coastal towns along, along the Sea of Marmara. Well, when Venizelos receives this information, he sort of said, yeah, it's okay, it's, it sounds good to me, but he was very cautious. That, that never happened. Now, we fast forward to October, no, November 1920, Venizelos decides to call an election. And, of course, we lost Asia Minor due to a monkey bite. In fact, Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes at the Imperial Conference in June to August 1921 said, so much blood and treasure has been, has been shed over a monkey bite. He was not pro-Greek at all. He was, he was 
he was pro-Turkish. Now, when the, the, the royalists were very well set up for, the, for their campaign, very well set up, that the Venezuelans, I think, were very lackadaisical, they were very lazy, they assumed that they would win the election in a landslide. Lord Granville, the, the British minister in, in Athens, visited Negroponte, who, who was the Greek finance minister in the Venezuela's government. And they all thought, ha ha, this is going to be a shoo-in. But when the results came in, it was no good. Then the royalists that come into power, then they, ha then they held the plebiscite, and then after that the Allies then cut the, the financial assistance to Greece, and then Greece was basically left on its own. I won't go into the military details and all that, but Ankara, if, we had a, if Greece had have won Ankara, the war would have been over Red Rover, but we didn't. In, in September 1922, we see the end of nearly three millennia of Greek civilization in, in Asia Minor that the Kamalists enter in an orderly manner at about eight, nine o'clock in the morning in Smyrna. You know, and, and the Turkish commanders had told the local population, don't worry, everything's going to be OK, don't worry. But the locals were quite suspicious of, uh, of Turkish motives. Then, uh, then on September 13, the city is torched and the evidence is overwhelming that the Turks lit the fire, lit the fuse, that burnt a great city. Uh, two weeks later after that, there is a revolution in Greece where the royalist government is, is swept out of office or basically kicked out, that the king is told, if you don't go, we'll execute you. So we have a, a revolutionary committee led by Plastidas and, uh, and Gornatas and, and Captain Focas from the, from the Navy. They set up a revolution committee and what they do is they will try the royalist politicians and some of the military for the Asia Minor disaster. What became known in, in famous Greek history, the trial of six. They were executed, including uh, the Hadzianestes. Prince Andrew, the father of the late uh, Prince Philip of, uh, of England, he was put up for trial as well. But due to the intervention of Venizelos and, and, the, and the papal nuncio saved his life and they got him out in time. Now, I'll fast forward now, now to the Lausanne Conference, which was supposedly to establish peace once and for all in, in the Near East. The two issues that concerned Greece was the future of the Patriarchio. The, the Turks were insistent that the Patriarchia must be removed lock, stock and barrel somewhere, maybe Mount Athos. That Venizelos argued, well, that can't be done. We, we have church councils that go back to Nicaea in 350, whatever it is, to, to, to keep it here. But, but the French thought, thought otherwise and said, OK, the, the Patriarchia can remain here, but all its political influence should be stripped away and just be a purely religious institution. So it was the French and the British and the Americans who worked towards this to ensure that that took place. But in the Treaty of Luzon, the Patriarchia is not mentioned. It sort of comes in Articles 37 to 45, which cover the, the minority provisions. The other, the other issue which, which was very, very important was the issue of uh, reparations in the second phase of the conference in May of 1923. The Turks were insistent that Greece had to pay reparations. But Venezuela said, Izmit, we, we have a, a refugee crisis. We can't even feed our people. We can't even do this. We can't do that. No, you must pay. That's the way you are. So, so Venezuela and, and, uh, and Foreign Minister Alexandri said, that's the way you are. We're going to abort the conference. And the Greek army in, in Western Thrace was ready to march. And, and when the Allies heard this, oh, no, 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 don't do that. No, 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 we don't want another war. So, so in the end, Izmit saw that 
they were war weary, like we were war weary. So finally, instructions came from Ang from Angora or Ankara that to accept that Greece cannot pay reparations. And so, so what Greece offered them was a was a was a strategic uh, territory around the Adrianopoli thing called the Karagach. Uh, it was a strategic r railway, but the Turks accepted that and defused potentially a war situation. And uh, finally, an another area of mine which I'm doing research on is uh, Greek POWs. And, I, and I've published a fairly lengthy article on that in a, in a book, I think, uh, published by the Mavropoulos, uh, uh, my, my friend George Mavropoulos in, uh, in Chicago, the, uh, the Pontus uh, Institute there, as such. So, I've tried to cover as much information as I can in the 15 minutes like that. I think I may have spared about a minute, I think, out of all that.